Yes, uh, nice to see you all, even though it's only um, online. I'm looking forward to uh, the project resuming in, in real life again. But as you might know, there is an ongoing deliberative constitutional writing process in Chile. And I'm collaborating with colleagues in Chile who are monitoring the, the process. Uh, and they are mainly interested in the part participatory part of it. The project that we are operating is called Platforma Contexto. It has two main objectives to promote the informed and active participation of citizens in constituents uh, processes and to foster transparency of the process in all its stages. And as men mentioned, two of my collaborators are here. Um, Amy Kersenbaum, who is the executive director of Foundation Nomala, and uh, Professor uh, Domingo Lovera Parma, who is speaking uh, here today and will uh, tell us about the process. Now, uh, Domingo is an uh, associate professor of law at uh, Universidad Diego Portales in, uh, in Chile. And his research mainly focused on constitutional uh, law, constitutional rights, and etc. Uh, Domingo, I'll give the floor to you. Uh, thanks, Eric, and, and thanks everyone for for having the the opportunity to present uh, in this uh, fifteen minutes some ideas about the the ongoing uh, process uh, in, in Chile. Today, I, I want to present uh, three main ideas. First. Uh, the political constitutional context, as I see it, uh, that in a certain way uh, explain why we are in the middle of this constituent process right now. Uh, very briefly, the stages that uh, the constituent process has in, in Chile. And what I think is most important for uh, our discussion is the challenges, uh, the way we see it, uh, concerning public participation and, uh, if, uh, and, and deliberative um, participation in the constituent process. So first, about the, the political constitutional context. Um, I think it's fair to say that since the very, the very first day uh, the constitution of 1980 was imposed, you, uh, we started to hear voices that were complaining about the legitimacy of this uh, constitution. Uh, different from other uh, countries, in the case of Chile, we uh, transited to democracy without having a constituent moment. So we uh, transited to democracy following the path that was uh, already settled in the constitution imposed by the very same dictatorship. Um, so as soon as I said the 1980 constitution was imposed, we started hearing claims uh, complaining about the legitimacy of the 1980 constitution. Uh, by 1989, however, uh, the democratic coalition, somewhat forced by circumstances, of course, uh, accepted the itinerary that was uh, defined in the 1980 constitution. And in a certain way, we did uh, the legitimacy of the constitution. Uh, I don't want to be a critic of this uh, position. You have to be, of course, uh, on, their, on, their, uh, uh, on their feet and on their shoes. Uh, re remember that Pinochet was still in power. After uh, the transition to democracy, Pinochet remained as the commander in chief of the army officer. And after that, he remained as a as a, a senator for life, according to the regulations that were defined in the very same constitution of 1980. So uh, there is no judgment about what took uh, the democratic opposition to accept this, but this was part of the circumstances of the epoch, right? But in a way, uh, in a certain way, that, that meant that the legitimacy of the 1980 constitution was accepted. And the idea was trying to fight against its undemocratic regulations by means of the very same uh, constitution, right? Uh, so, um, of course, many, many amendments were actually passed under the 1980 uh, constitution ruling. Some of the important uh, amendments were passed in 1989. Um, uh, then many other amendments have been passed in the years that follow. And then again, a, a big package of uh, amendments was uh, again approved in 2005. I mentioned these reforms of, 2000, of 2005 because uh, by that time, then President Ricardo Lagos, in a very optimistic way, I think, uh, declared that with these uh, reforms of 2005, uh, the division of Chileans concerning the constitution 
was over. Oh, you can see in the, in the quote that I took uh, from him, he's saying that today the new constitutional text lives up to the democratic spirit of all Chileans, that we are now united behind this uh, constitutional text. This is a, a day of joy, of unity and reunion, right? Um, some claim, and this is what you're going to find probably in the scholarly discussion about uh, what has been happening with these reforms. Some claim that these reforms put an end to uh, Pinochet's constitution. After all, there have, been, there have been, been more than 50 amendments to this constitutional text, by far the most uh, amended constitutional text in the Chilean uh, history. On the other side, you will find voices, this is uh, at least my case, who believe that these uh, reforms, although important, didn't touch upon the DNA of the uh, dictatorship's constitutional legacy. Um, it might be of concern, and I mentioned this because Claudio Fuentes, who cannot be here today, has been uh, an extended uh, uh, research on this. All these amendments, uh, in a certain way, were passed without significant citizen involvement. Those of, of uh, 2005, for example, that were very important. Uh, let me just point out that these reforms of 2005 concentrated judicial review uh, powers in the constitutional court, right? So these reforms were passed, uh, were, were agreed between the political parties, were uh, approved in Congress, and citizens were not called, not even to have a, a, a say in a, in a, in a, ratifying, uh, in a ratification plebiscite or something of the kind. So these reforms have been mainly agreed between the political elites without citizen involvement. What is the test, I think, to, to, to to notice that the uh, DNA of the uh, Pinochet constitution was not touched with these uh, reforms. I would say that we have to take a look to, to the massive demonstrations of students uh, that were uh, developing two big waves, 2006 and then 2011. So we, we, what, what we have in this uh, massive protest that the students were conducting, in the first wave of protest, students were uh, directly targeting the uh, educational system that uh, Chile had by then. Uh, we could fairly say that this was part of the legacy of the dictatorship, although its roots are more um, old. But of course, the way confronting, and you can see in the banner that these students are holding there, that they were confronting specifically the um, educational model that the, constitutional, uh, that the Constitution of 1980 uh, enshrined. What was important about this protest was that as soon as the political class started to try to answer the claims of the students, uh, these uh, answers started to face the obstacles that the Constitution of 1980 was imposing. So there was, I, as, I, as I see it, there was political will to address the claims of the students. But then we have the structural um, regulation of the Constitution of 1980 that in some way uh, blocked many of the reforms that were required to be passed to address the claims of the students. And the important thing was that the uh, claims moved from the educational arena to a more, if you allow me to put it in these terms, uh, constitutional uh, issues. So the constitution became a political issue uh, clearly for the students. So what the students were claiming was a uh, to, to uh, reconsider the educational system and to have a new educational system uh, free for all and uh, egalitarian for all. And within a few months, they were complaining about having a constituent assembly. So what explained this turn? Well, what explained this turn is that uh, these reforms started to face the obstacles that um, the Constitution of 1980 imposed. So we changed from these educational claims to claims about the uh, super majoritarian quorums that the Constitution of 1980 enshrines for passing laws, uh, the overreaching powers of the president vis a vis those of the Congress, the uh, great, great powers that the Constitutional Court has to declare the unconstitutionality of certain laws. So, as I say, the uh, constitutional topic became part of the political agenda. Uh, and I would say that this, uh, the, the resurgiment of the constitutional claim reached its momentum in the elections, in the presidential elections of 2014. For that election, mainly all the candidates proposed in a certain way, uh, some more ambitious, some less ambitious, uh, uh, comprehensive reforms to the constitution of 1980. But for the right wing uh, candidate, Evelyn Matei, all the other candidates, there were like 11 candidates, as far as I can remember, Janina may help me, uh, in remembering here uh, this, but 
all of them proposed a comprehensive reform to the 1980 constitution. And President Bachelet in, he, in her uh, second term proposed uh, an interesting itinerary and Janina has conducted uh, very well an interesting research on that um, itinerary to, to, to change, to replace Pinochet's constitution. For many reasons that we can discuss later, if you want that uh, uh, itinerary, that attempt uh, uh, failed, in my view, uh, in a certain fashion boycotted by, uh, by from within the, the very same uh, political coalition that was or that was supposed to be behind uh, President Bachelet. And after that, we had the, elect the presidential elections of 2018 where President uh, Piñera was elected, which took many commentators to uh, to, to decide, to judge that the constitutional claim was over. So we have President Bachelet, we have uh, her interesting process uh, that failed, we have some compre comprehensive reforms to the educational system that also failed, and then we have the election of the right-wing uh, coalition uh, candidate, where, and this took, as I said, many commentators to, 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 to decide that the constitutional uh, uh, claim was over until we had uh, the estallido. You have there a picture of the, what was called the largest protest in Chile, almost 1 million people was gathered only in, in Santiago, uh, some 500,000 people in the other uh, parts of, of Chile. Uh, and of course, some issues of, of big and uh, important violence that were taking place during the, the, the estallido, right? So what happened after uh, the estallido uh, emerged? We have this, uh, so we have the, the, the estallido, the protests that were developing since October the, 20, uh, the, the 18th. And then uh, these uh, claims, these protests, these demonstrations took the political class to reach an agreement barely a month after the protests had begun in order to offer to the citizen a path to replace uh, the 1980 constitution. Almost all political forces, but for a few uh, parties, were seated at the table of that uh, on November 15, 3.27 a.m. in the morning. I was uh, traveling from Mexico to Santiago, so I opened my cell phone as soon as I arrived to find uh, the main aspects of this acuerdo or agreement that, as I said, main political uh, forces agreed, offering the citizen a path to replace the 1980 constitution, a path that was later um, legalized, constitutionalized in a constitutional amendment, uh, significantly published on December the uh, 24th. So you can see that within two months, we have this big protest, we have a, a very extended political agreement and then a constitutional amendment offering this uh, stage, uh, this uh, process to replace the constitution, which has these uh, four stages. The first stage is the entry referendum we just had on October the 25th. As you may, may know, 80% uh, of Chileans approved the idea of having a new constitution and 80% of Chileans approved the idea of having a constitutional convention um, uh, composed by elective representatives to draft the new constitution. We are transiting to this uh, second stage, the election of the 155 representatives that will sit at the constitutional convention. This will take place in, in a month, in, in, a, in a month and a half from, from now, April the 11th of 2021. Then we have uh, uh, the, the work of the convention, which will take According to regulations, the convention will have nine months extended up to 12 months. Almost everyone agrees that the convention will take the, the 12 months. So it's going to be a, a year of working in drafting the new constitution. This should run throughout June 2021, throughout uh, June 2022. And then we have this ratification referendum with mandatory vote that uh, if COVID doesn't say anything on the contrary, will have to take place on August of 2022. So which are the challenges and um, using the two and a half minutes that I have left to, to, to present these uh, challenges. Um, we are transiting then to the second stage, the election of the 155 conventionales. This is the way the, the reform called them, instead of assemblies or deputies or anything of the kind, conventionals, conventionales in, in Spanish. Uh, the, con the convention should be installed by the third week of May of uh, this year, first week of June probably. And, and as soon as the conventionales assume, their functions will, uh, will have to elect a president uh, a vice president in the first meeting, and then they have to agree by two thirds of its members, the regulations of the constitutional convention. And here the convention has ample margin to define which are going to be the rules according to which it uh, will uh, achieve it, its task of drafting the new constitution. 
Uh, which are the concerns regarding public participation and, and political deliberation, the way I see it? Well, there is a widespread political distrust toward the same faces, las mismas caras uh, of the political parties which are involved in, uh, th that were involved in the acuerdo and that are now highly involved in presenting candidates for the constitutional convention. I think the first disillusionment will come in April when they see, when the citizen will see that uh, mostly all of the uh, representatives to the convention will be members of political parties. I don't have a problem with that, but this is going to be something that we will have to face as a problem or as, as a challenge to uh, the constitutional convention because there is a felt demand from the city assembly to take part in the constituent process. Even though the election will want to be uh, completely elected by the city assembly, this is still this claim um, that is repeating over and over again. We want to participate we don't, we don't want to have only a voice, we want to have a vote. We want our participation to be meaningful. And this is going to be a challenge that the Constitutional Convention will have to face when, it, uh, when, when, it, when, when drafting its own uh, regulations. So this is the main concern. How will regular people take part in the debate? As far as I can tell, all the drafts that have been proposed uh, for the rules that the Constitutional Convention should approve uh, by universities, by think tanks, by political parties include some uh, form of participation for uh, regular citizens. Some more intensive, of course, some more marginal. You can take a look here. This is a, a, a page that I took from a newspaper from um, yesterday or day before yesterday, when they are mapping who are the, those voices and institutes and universities and parties that are involved already in drafting uh, regulations for the convention, because we, I think, we have learned from the, from the experience of Bolivia who took several months in drafting the regulations for the convention. So we are trying to, 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 to do some work ahead. Uh, so I, I assume that the convention once installed will have all these inputs from different uh, think tanks, universities, uh, organizations. Uh, so we'll have some base to discuss which, going to, which are going to be the rules for the convention. So um, three more brief uh, challenges. There is a strong debate concerning the transparency of the convention. So if you allow me to put this in, in two extremes, you have the Communist Party saying that the convention must be surrounded by the people. So we have to keep a, a close eye on the work of the convention and every single uh, meeting has to be uh, streamed and open to the public. And on the other hand, you have some right-wing scholars that have been uh, calling for the need to have a, a, what we call in Spanish a kitchen room, a, a cocina, so a closed space probably with some beers and with the oven turned on, where we can reach some agreements uh, besides, be behind the uh, public knowledge. So this is one concern. The other concern is the budget. So far, uh, the general budget law has approved 7.7 .7 million euros for the working of the convention. I have heard some voices, I don't have knowledge in this, that uh, have been claiming that this may be too little money for the work of the convention. And a somewhat minor concern, but this might be of interest to you uh, people, is uh, how to reach consensus. Because uh, the convention, this is some regulation that the convention cannot, uh, cannot change. The convention has to approve its, uh, the norms of the new constitution. This is what the current text of the constitution say, by two thirds of its members, by no means a high uh, quorum, but uh, the concern is how we, uh, the convention is going to, to reach, if it can. Uh, consensus on such a high uh, quorum. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Domingo. This is uh, extremely um, interesting. Amy, do you want to add something? Oh, not for now, not really. I'm very interested at, uh, about comments and questions. And then if I have anything to add, I, I will later. But I'm, I'm fascinated to see how, how others experience, people experience, experience people can react to, to what we're living through. Thank you. Um, before we jump into uh, questions and answers, my attention has been drawn to that we have apparently gotten a new MC observer from Chile, and Janina, are you, I understand you will introduce her. Yeah, so um, first of all, I want to thank Domingo for this overview. I think uh, it was a real challenge and, and you did it. Uh, you managed to explain 
all the context and the main challenges in 15 minutes, which, uh, and, and super clearly, I would like to discuss many things with you. But before that, uh, I want to introduce Pamela Figueroa. Pamela has joined the action as a observer recently. She is professor at the University of Santiago de Chile. And I want to tell everybody that she also was engaged in the organization of the citizens' dialogues during uh, former President Bachelet um, um, position in the executive. So she knows from first hand what happened there. In fact, she was part of the team developing the project. And now she is uh, also engaged in an observatory of the new constitution, which appears in the newspaper, where, which uh, Domingo, the page Domingo showed us. I think it's Thomas Jordan in there, but um, Pamela is also part of this initiative. So I want to welcome her and tell everybody that she is here so we can ask also her some questions. Thank you, Janina. Um, Pamela, um, would you perhaps want to elaborate a little bit on Domingo's talk? Okay, I'm not hearing any response at the moment. Okay, the, uh, the floor is open for questions and comments to uh, Domingo if um, somebody has, an, has a comment or a question to raise, then please just jump in, I guess, or let me know somehow if you have um, some questions. Yes, Elena. Thank you, Domingo, for your presentation. Very clear, um, um, very summarized. But uh, I, I jump to the, the challenges if <laughs> because this is the, the, the key of, of, of the process. Uh, I, I was a little surprised in, in how was the decision to uh, elect these, these uh, representatives to the conventional, uh, to the assembly, because uh, as, as far as I know, you can confirm it, but uh, they, they, the basis of the organization were the districts, the, the ordinary districts of, of elections, and, and that, uh, that created a lot of confusion about how the lists were presented, the electoral list, uh, because there was a mixture of politicians, but they tried to incorporate people, you know, to avoid this, this view of the, the, um, the same people as always. And, and there, there is a kind of uh, complex procedure that uh, I think uh, is the first step uh, of uh, delegitimating de a little bit the, how the process started. Mm -hmm. As, um, as in, the, in, the, in this process, some of the candidacies were like annulated by others, you know, that uh, were able to reach more, more support in the, uh, on the constituency of the district. But the second, the second uh, common question is, I think um, that the most difficult is to really uh, decide what uh, this uh, not organized uh, process that you mentioned, if you can clarify a little bit more that, that are the, the rules of the convention. This is very important to warranty that uh, their decisions, that they have to reach these two thirds of consensus, but uh, um, the, the way they are going to work is the, the key to, to just to get an, an input of legitima legitima uh, legitimation for, for this uh, specific project, because it has uh, um, raised a lot of uh, citizen expectations and if it's just uh, going to work as an ordinary assembly without trying to generate uh, and, and to work with uh, more external actors and external procedures, it's going to be very limited in, in their, you know, uh, as uh, giving an answer to, to the concerns that uh, just give raise to, to um, give origin to all this process. Thank you, um, Elena. I have a couple of more uh, hands raised and we are running out of time. So I will collect those uh, before giving Domingo um, the floor back. Uh, Norbert, you wanted to... Yeah, just briefly, because I was, yes. I was writing on 
referendums, constitutional referendums and, and in, in Africa. And we had the South African referendum. And by the way, in that I worked on, on the first and the second referendum. And I have to congratulate. I think it was only Spain which had two referendum, one at the beginning and the other one at the end. So this is quite good. But on the other side, when it comes to the, con the, to the uh, constitutional uh, convention, um, I'm really a, bit, a little bit skeptical. I mean, 7 million, you need much more, as my opinion, when it comes to outreach programs, when you go into, this, into the public space and want to, when you're asking for comments or other things. And this is not so much, actually, in my opinion. So I, I doubt that it could be enough. And the other question, I think most of you have the same question. Uh, this is a group of experts and organized interest groups, political parties, other civil society groups. There is no ordinary citizen group in. There is no what we now find in Europe randomly selection group, for example. Ordinary groups could could additionally be, com be complementary to this one. No? And so um, it's very fascinating. But I, I I remember the two one in Africa which were failing. That was a Kenyan one and the Zimbabwean one. We had a lot of convention and later on the Minister of the Interior changed the whole draft constitution and added the most toxic issues. They changed it slightly and then they both failed. So I don't want Chile to run into the same problem. <laughs> Thank you, Norbert. Um, oh yeah, you have a raised hand as well? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you to the Professor Lovera. I have a question. I was wondering if uh, any of the input that Chile has received back when um, president back when this was also organized under President Bachelet. Will that have any impact on this current um, current constitution making process, or is that simply just tossed out completely? Okay, the last raised hand is Andrea. So yeah. if you can keep your comments relatively short, I will yeah. give the floor back to Domingo. Yeah, uh, thank you very much to Domingo for the presentation. My question very briefly is movements have pushed for constitutional reform and now they need to sit and collaborate uh, with people, say, on the far right in order to gain the two-thirds majority. How is this shaping their willingness uh, to be involved in such a process? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Domingo. You have a full plate <laughs> of uh, questions, and uh, I guess, but I, I, I must urge you to keep your response uh, uh, short. We are basically at the, at the end of our time, but I'm sure Min will allow us uh, uh, a little extra time. So, Domingo. Well, thanks, Eric, and thanks, everyone. Uh, very briefly, because I, I, I'd love to hear about uh, from, from Amy, Janina, or, or Pamela. I haven't seen you, Pamela. Hola. <laughs> you were in the other slide of the, of the images. So very briefly, Elena, uh, yes, we're going to use the same electoral uh, procedure and system for the parliamentary elections. That was the first uh, banner of alert that many um, that people from the social movements were, um, were uh, putting on the table. Why this was the method that was selected? I, I'm going to rely in the, in the public reasons that we can actually trust. Uh, there was, as, as, I, as I tried to show, this was a process that developed very, very quickly. Within two months, we had from the, the estallido until the constitutional reform, which opened the, the, the floor for having a new constitution. So there might be a, a, a prudential reason. This is what we have. Let's use it. Um, uh, but yes, it has been a point of very, very strong concern, as, as you mentioned. Um, again, the convention will have uh, ample uh, margin to define which are going the rules that will uh, um, organize its work. The only regulation they have to respect is to reach an agreement about the regulations by two thirds of its members. Other than that, the convention has, as I said, a total uh, decision on, on which the regulations are going to be. Uh, now, concerning what uh, uh, Norbert uh, mentioned about the inclusion of ordinary citizens. Of course, there's no ordinary citizens. They have to run as candidates. We have the candidates now running and you have ordinary citizens that were able to gather the, the signatures that they needed to present the candidates and they're, they are, they're going to be on, on the ballot. That's important. I, I doubt that they're going to be chosen because of the structure of the procedure of the electoral system. Pamela can tell much more or, than me uh, about this. Uh, but again, what, what I've seen so far in all the drafts of the different regulations that the uh, universities, think tanks are proposing, 
all of them include some form of political participation. Of course, some are more intensive than others. For example, one that I've seen includes many kind of national fora or provincial or, or provincial fora that should be open so the convention can uh, came down to earth and talk face to face with citizens. That may not uh, probably put all the all the complaints aside, but there are, as I said, many many ideas going around how the convention should open the, the, the ground to have uh, ordinary citizens involved. I tell this because since 2019, it's impressive the amount of people that have uh, gathered in informal uh, conversations about the constitution. Uh, I, I know this is the case of Famela and, and, and has been the case of Amy, of Claudio and myself. We have been moving around when we could go out, right? We have been moving around Santiago and the country uh, for almost three months, talking with regular people about the constitutional matter. This has been, uh, for, so, for someone like me who is interested in popular constitutionalism, fantastic. I've been talking about uh, supermajority quorums in a, in a soccer field, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a chanty town in, in Santiago, but also with, uh, with uh, high entrepreneurs that are also concerned about what is going to occur with the with the investments and so on and so forth. So this has been a, a tremendous important moment. I think that people from law society should be, should be here as, as soon as we, we, we can travel um, to, to explore and to, to feel this, actually the smell of this process taking place. Oh yeah, um, in, in terms of regulations, no, of course, the, the, the tremendous amount of information that is very important that was gathering this uh, Encuentros Ciudadanos that we had during the, the itinerary that President Bachelet proposed uh, will not be mandatory for to be considered, but again, many of the propositions are uh, calling the attention of using that information because it's very recent information. And as far as I can tell, I also took part in one of those encounters. Uh, this there, there is information that has to has to be considered. So it, it will be taken a look at at least by I, I think by the convention. Pamela may correct me. Uh, and Andres, I think this is the most difficult question and the most uh, challenging uh, uh, concern that we have to face. Because again, there is widespread uh, distrust toward the political parties. Uh, recent uh, polls show that uh, the citizens, I mean, that the people who trust Congress and political parties is about 2%, 3%. Uh, so so um, the people uh, once, actually the, the people think that this process has been kind of an expropriation of a constituent process that belongs to the people themselves. So this is a very important challenge. I will connect it with, uh, with Norbert and, and Elena's concerns about how we are going to open the convention to, to have the input from uh, different movements uh, and organizations. And there's a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Domingo. This is uh, very uh, interesting and we will of course be following this situation very closely. I myself is, am hoping to be able to travel to Chile in autumn to observe the, uh, the process um, on the ground, if COVID allows. <laughs> uh, so we will continue this uh, discussion um, in the future. I will give the floor back to Min. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Domingo. Uh, by the way, I mean, because Pamela is MC observer for people from across countries, so greater Europe countries, they can travel to Chile. Unfortunately, we, can, we cannot host a true STSM Chilean colleagues, but you guys can actually travel to Chile. Of course, budget permitting and COVID permitting, but this is also something that you can keep in mind. Um, if there is no other things that you want to say at this stage, well, we deserve then a, a break of 24 minutes or 23 minutes before our next and last uh, meeting of the day. But Janina, yes. I think Pamela wants to say something just to... Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry because I, I had the problem with the uh, Wi-Fi a couple of minutes ago. And um, thank you, Janina, Min, and everyone. Thank you, Domingo, for a great presentation about the process in Chile. Uh, I just want to add that um, uh, we have the same electoral system, but with a very important innovation because for the first time we have gender parity and reserved uh, seats for indigenous people. And in this campaign, six, the 60% of the candidates are not from political parties. We have a lot of independent candidates 
So it's a, a great opportunity to have new faces in politics. Um, besides all the constraints, um, the, the emotion of, of most of people is hope in this process. So I think that it's, it's very important for us uh, that all of you follow the process and know about what is going on in Chile. And as Oya asked, um, the, the dialogues on, from 2016 are systematized, so you can find all the information in the web. And President Bachelet um, draw a, a, a total project of a new constitution based on this dialogue. And that project that is in the Congress now has been taken for all, for many, uh, not just political party, but also independent people to, uh, to have that conversation on the table on this process. And also the reform of the law um, that changed, uh, that allowed the plebiscite, the national plebiscite for the new constitution, have uh, as an um, antecedent the project that President Bachelet sent of 2017 to amend the constitution to allow a, a, a constitutional process. So you can find different, you know, uh, uh, ways to connect the process from 2016 to the, to the, what is going on in Chile now. So thank you. Nice to meet you, everyone. Thank you very much, Pamela. And let's hope the discussion continues, of course. Uh, good time for a break and see you in a, in a couple of minutes for the next meeting. And thanks again to Domingo and Amy for, for joining us.